Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Orange Weekly presented by Krause Health. My name is Brent Dax, and on the other side of the screen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, shame on me. That's the first time he's been on the show this year because he's been cranking out so much great stuff. Our good friend Chris Carlson is with us here from Syracuse.com. Hello, Chris. Hey, Brent. How are you? I'm great, man. It's good to see you. Not that uh, we don't enjoy seeing Nate or Mike Curtis or any other great guests that, that come on with us here, but uh, shame on me. I've made it nine games into the year, and this is your first time around, but you know, timing's everything too, Chris, because we got football. Technically, it is basketball season, but we're not saying is it basketball season because football's no. bad, right? They're both still very much in the conversation here, so that's a good thing. And uh, yep, we'll very inter- football's been very stuff. interesting. Yeah, very a lot of interesting stuff to get into for sure. So, uh, look, what can you take away from a Division Two team in an exhibition game? Take some of it with a grain of salt, but pretty impressive debut for Syracuse basketball last night. So we'll get into that. Uh, coming up here uh, shortly. But uh, Chris, I do want to start on the football front for this team. And just a reminder, by the way, for those of you that are watching us live on Facebook and our Syracuse Orange Sports YouTube page, that we do uh, archive this on YouTube. You can uh, watch it uh, whenever you want on YouTube. We put it out on our SYR football Twitter feed. Uh, We'll put a post up on Syracuse.com as well. But we do pop on live here on Orange Weekly, presented by Krause Health. Thursdays at about one o'clock or so, and we'll be doing that throughout uh, Syracuse football and basketball season. Chris, let's start with football. And I really like the piece that you had up that uh, people can read here on Thursday on Syracuse.com. We have never seen a stretch of close games like this for Syracuse football, really ever, right? So yep. we were wondering about this as these three-point games piled up. And then last week, it's a five-point game. We were talking about it internally in some meetings and stuff. We're like, man, has there ever been a stretch like this? And the answer to that is no. So take us through that piece that you wrote and and the nail-biting games that we've been going through here with this football team. Yeah, I mean, I think we started talking about it maybe two games ago, you know, after after Liberty, um, Florida State, and and Wake Forest were all decided by a field goal. And it was like, man – three in a row with three, with three points and, and all at the end, like, has that ever happened? Um, you know, and, and we weren't smart enough to look it up at the time, uh, but two games later when we're still having close games, you know, it's just like, this is man, like, like has this ever happened? And I've always wondered how, you know, teams pour it out one week and, you know, with their emotions and their energy and, and, it has to be really hard to do it again the next week. Like, you know how it is when you have a good day at work, you go, you come in, you take a victory lap. Yeah. yeah. You know, I won an award or, or that thing was great. You know, you little just validation, right? Yeah. Strut around the office a little bit and kind of take it easy. Um, you know, you have a, you have a bad day where, where you get something wrong um, and, and uh, your audience yells at you um, and maybe you mope a little bit the next day. Uh, it has to be really hard for these guys to just do it week after week after week. Um, and I, I've just been really impressed with, you know, how how they've stayed. They've played hard every single game when they could have emotionally, right? They, they could have finger pointed. They oh, could blame sure. the coaches. Yeah. Player Tommy DeVito is leaving. Taj Harris is leaving. They really could have gone in, into a funk. Um and if nothing else, like they're playing better, you know, they're, 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 they're improving and, and progressing and, and maybe peaking. Yeah. What is Chris, Chris, what does Dino say? Uh, Dino Baber say iron sharpens iron, hottest fire makes the strongest steel. Like he was going to run out of expressions because after a while, like you just got to get that satisfaction mm-hmm. of a victory, right? Like there's only so many speeches you can get. There's only so many, we're there, we're close that you can say until you actually get that feeling and that validation. I think Garrett Schrader was even saying it in post game and a little bit this week about how, you know, you just needed that feeling of a win to walk away from. It's a different conversation when you win games like that versus when you lose games like that. So Syracuse out of that four and four and five in a row, five points or less. All of us have predicted Syracuse to beat Boston college this week. And by all of us, I mean, myself, Chris, Mike Curtis, Nate Mink, the crew that picks this game. If BC is a team that's their quarterback situation is kind of a shoulder shrug at this point. We don't really know. We think it's going to be Grossell again, but any number of players could be out there. They run the ball well. Uh, they have a pretty good defense, but they haven't scored more than 14 points here 
in uh, what is it three straight games spe- uh, specifically after Phil Jerkovic went down their big time quarterback. So one would think this is not going to be another close game, but Chris, it is technically a rivalry game. Yep. It is homecoming. It is just one of those things where maybe you, you do toss the records out because a week ago, you know, Syracuse was facing a Virginia tech team. That was like 111th in the country in scoring. And it just looked like all the advantages went their way and more drama. Right. So I guess don't assume anything going into this game. Yeah. You know, um, Syracuse certainly looks like the better team, you know, that they, they know what they are on offense um, and, and it's working. Um, but we'll see how they handle the wins. We've, we've seen how they handle the losses and, and they've come back well from losses, but we'll see how they handle the good fortune. And, and if they, you know, have the same grind uh, against Boston college, you know, they, the Eagles do have a really good offensive line. Um, they've got a, a pretty good running back. Um, you know, so so if they're able to run the ball, you know, it could be a low possession game. You know, they could work the clock and, and maybe it gets a little dicey. Um, I, I know, you know, they weren't great against the run against Louisville, but, but Jeff Halfley, their second-year coach, mentioned, hey, I, I feel pretty good about our run defense, um, you know, now, whether he means it or not, we'll find out. This is but, the week you know, to find out, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. He, he talked a good game, you know, in terms of, like, he doesn't think they're going to be overwhelmed um, completely in the run game. Um, so, you know, wouldn't be shocked if it – wouldn't be shocked if it's close. Um, we'll be very surprised if, if Syracuse loses. It just seems like these are teams going two different directions kind of at this point in the year. You know, BC gave up 331 rushing yards a week ago to Louisville, which is, you know, frankly, not hard to do to a guy like Malik Cunningham running all over the place. Garrett Schrader is not a burner that way, but man, he, when he gets away, he gets away the long strides. He's hard to tackle. It's funny to hear Schrader say like the only time he takes off and runs is when the defense is so keyed in on Sean Tucker. And I'm thinking like, well, that's all the time. <laughs> so if you've got that advantage, if you're Schrader, but yeah, that, that double barreled running attack that Syracuse has, but Chris, it's really been the throws that Schrader has made the past two weeks in particular that have defined him. You asked about this in, in post game after that game against Virginia tech Schrader has taken some shots. I mean, that throw to Trevor Pena, he got tattooed. And then of course this week, the throw to Damian Alford, I don't even think he saw it because he got leveled again. So while that Syracuse offensive line has held up pretty well, considering some injuries and some things that obviously they've been scrutinized for the past couple of, of years. Those two throws, man, that's that'll earn you a lot of brownie points with Syracuse fans because he's hanging in there till that last possible millisecond to get it out there. And Dino's been saying, look, we've seen this guy throw the ball in practice. We just haven't seen it collectively as a fan base and media until the last two weeks. But maybe we're starting to see that that passing game come alive a little bit too. There were two things kind of behind the scenes that I thought were really cool um, this week. One, one I sort of tweeted, um, the one that I didn't. So Marlo Wax is talking to us yesterday um, about the defense and their approach late in the Virginia Tech game and getting the ball back. Um, and he didn't say, like, we need to get the ball back for our offense. He said, we need to get the ball back for Schrader. Mm. It, like, and it just, you know, to me, that feels like a team that it is learning to trust its quarterback that is learning that is sort of galvanizing around its quarterback and like you know they view him as their guy now you know when when maybe there were split loyalties at the start of the season or we didn't know who the quarterback was you know like we have to get the ball back for Schrader and we trust that good things are going to happen and he's going to do good things at the end of the game um the other thing that I thought was really cool was uh you know we talked to him. It was almost a year to the day, uh, the Virginia Tech game, since he transferred from Mississippi State. Um, and, you know, a little bit of full circle, right? Mike Leach tells him, I don't think you're a quarterback. Right. Uh, comes to Syracuse, makes the, the game winning play. Dino Babers tells him, get up and act like a hero. Uh, pretty cool. You know, and we're talking about Mississippi State. And, and the natural question is, like, hey, do you use that as motivation? Like, you know, the, the whole Michael Jordan, I felt disrespected right. uh, yeah. thing, you know, and he, 
he thought about it, which is pretty cool that he thought about it. And he's just like, no, like, I don't think so. Like, I've always been confident in my abilities. Um, and I think he sort of carried himself like that all year. You know, he'll 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 shoot it to you straight. Um, he talked about the quarterback competition and, and, you know, he, he deferred to Tommy and was respectful of the guy that was here first, but like, was also just like, Hey, like, I think I should be playing here too. <laughs> you know, like, um, and I think he's really, he's carried himself the way you would want all year. And now that it's his, you know, it's sort of fun to see his personality emerge and, and see him sort of like, take over as like this being his team shameless plug by the way i wrote a column about this so i hope uh, you guys can check that out as you hear my dog in the background she's very excited about uh, everything that's going on with syracuse football so um but on on this on this note alan has an interesting comment here right on what we're talking about here he says five years telling the world that orange is the new fast and here we are right back to hand off in a cloud of dust so we have to change recruiting from tall fleet wide receivers to wideouts focused on downfield blockers. I don't think so, Alan. I think they can still recruit those big targets. I still feel, feel like they can get some athletes that Schrader can throw to that he's getting comfortable in this offense. We'll see that develop as we go here. But cross-reference that, Chris, with – so Schrader's starting to get comfortable, right? And he's starting to feel like this is his offense. Yet when he's talking to the media this week, he, he says, like, oh, Boston College, I'm not from around here. I guess that's a rivalry, right? which whole different topic. It's not really a rivalry. It's just kind of marriage of convenience and geography, but it goes to show you, he's still learning all that other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The football he's starting to get. It's all the other stuff about being the quarterback at Syracuse that he's taking in. And, and you can really only do over the course of a year or so. So I was kind of, I, I found that really interesting. And now that he feels like it's his team, and truly is with Tommy DeVito having transferred. I think, you know, we'll continue to see that improvement from him. His passing numbers have gone up week by week. We know he can run the football. He defers to Tucker, though, as the quarterback. You're technically the leader of the team. And it's going to be interesting to see how this goes uh, with four weeks to go here. The Orange are four and four. Obviously, the bowl game is the goal. And they've got uh, a few opportunities to do that. And, Chris, if, if you want to really assure yourself a little less stress down the road here. You win today. You win Saturday, pardon me. That's win five, a much needed bye week for this team. And then in the last three weeks, I mean, you've got some challenges there, but if you get win five on Saturday, it, it takes a, a little bit of a load off down the road to beat a Louisville. You, you play Pittsburgh in the last game of the season at the dome, which the way things are going right now, not looking like an easy thing and at NC state. Also not an easy win for this team. So they're going to have to win up at some point to get that six win. But if you get win five in your back pocket this week, just makes it that much easier. Yeah, that, you know, without – unless NC State, they're having some injury issues on defense. and Unless they come out and look really bad, you know, the next couple of weeks. Syracuse is probably an underdog in all three of those games, um, I would think. You know, on the road against Louisville and North Carolina State. And then Pittsburgh, which looks phenomenal. Um, in the final game. Um, but if you, if you beat BC, you sort of, you feel like you have a shot in all those games, you know, right? You, you, For sure. Yeah. You're pretty even with Louisville. Louisville's played a lot of close games, just like Syracuse has. Uh, you know, NC State's not world beaters. They're pretty balanced, but they're losing some defensive players. Um, and then Pitt, you play them here, uh, you know. So, so you beat BC, you get one game away, and then you take your three shots. And, you know, you, you hope to get at least one of them. Um, and, and the way they're playing, you know, I would like their chances of stealing one of the three. Um, you know, I just think Syracuse is playing like they're not perfect, but they're they're playing pretty good football right now. Well, on that note, I just highlighted a comment from Allison in that the defense and the special teams need to show up this week. Yeah. That's a little bit of a concern, Chris, because the defense and Syracuse got into ACC plays, giving up 31 and a half points per game. They have slipped a little bit. I still like this scheme, and I still think this defense ultimately helps this team win and keeps it competitive. But they had such a load on their shoulders for so long that we've started to see some leaks there. You know, Garrett Williams banged up. Maybe some other players out there going through some owies here, looking forward to that bye week coming up here. So that slipped a little bit. Obviously, we've seen some struggles on special teams. There was the blocked extra point. Andre Schmidt missed two kicks. And – 
the one saving grace, though, Chris, that, that game last week reminded me a lot of Dumb and Dumber, right? Like just when I thought you couldn't get any worse, you totally redeem yourself. Trevor Pena yeah. comes out with the 51-yard kick and sets up that second-to-last touchdown for Courtney Jackson. So it just feels like bend but don't break applied to a lot of things on the field. But that's noted, Allison, and that's a good comment about defense and special teams have not been as sharp as they need to be. And in order to win some of these games down the stretch, they're, they're going to have to play better, bottom line, and, and help the offense out a little bit. Yeah, Pena's, Pena's been good all year. Um, that was his first sort of game breaker, but but he's been pretty good all year. Um, but he's been the only good thing about special teams, right? It, it's hard to imagine that James Williams, he's been so consistently not good, and, and we haven't really seen him be good, uh, that it's hard to think that their punting game is going to improve a ton you know, before the end of the season. Um, but you'd like to think that they could get the, the kicking ironed out. I mean, we've seen Andre Schmidt be good. Uh, you know, there, there's no reason that he should be missing the shorty against Virginia Tech that he did, uh, you know, regardless of whether the hold and the snap, which were which have been issues at points, mm-hmm. um, you know, were good. You, you just can't miss that short a kick. Um, you know, and, and defense, I, I talked to Josh Black a little bit yesterday, um, and he said they were surprised a little bit by what Virginia Tech did in the first half. Uh, you know, they, they've done mostly, they've gone mostly spread um, this season and, you know, they've run sort of outside zone and, and stretch plays and, and they changed things up a lot against Syracuse, uh, probably because of the three, three, five personnel, it's a little bit lighter. Um, so they use their tight end a lot more. Um, they, they did a lot more interior running than Syracuse expected. Um, so they're optimistic that sort of the first half struggles were just a little bit of getting surprised and that they were able to to make corrections at halftime. Um, they did get, you know, they gave up the big touchdown at the end that, that looked like it was going to put Syracuse, you know, underground, uh, you know, until the heroics. Uh, but th- there's at least some optimism from the defenders that that was just like sort of a a one-game blip, you know, because Virginia Tech was bad on offense until that game, right? Really? We, yeah. we did not, you know, Wake Forest, okay. You know, Wake Forest has scored on everybody. They, they scored 70 points in, in 17 right. minutes against yeah. the Army. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, you gave up points to Wake Forest, okay. It's not good when you're giving up points to Virginia Tech, and, and it won't be good if you're giving up points to Boston College. And you can, I was going to say, you can almost apply that to BC this week, given the struggles they've had in certain areas. Well, Chris, when I took my daughter to school this morning, I had to get the ice scraper out of the garage. So that can only mean one thing. Syracuse basketball has entered the chat, ladies and gentlemen. Now, uh, you can't tell the world from one exhibition game, particularly against a, a pretty small Division II team in pace that the Orange played at the Dome last night. However, a couple of things that stand out in that game that are really intriguing. Number one is Jesse Edwards. Looked pretty darn good. He looks bigger. He looks faster. He looks more confident and maybe healthy. I would put Frank Anselm kind of in that conversation as well, but Jesse's a little more intriguing. And number two is Cole Swider. I think he came as advertised, Chris, but to see it in front of our eyes and to give Syracuse a third dynamic three-point option, we know what Joe Girard and Buddy Beheim can do. And Jimmy Beheim can hit some threes too, don't get me wrong. But Cole, like, I, I wrote it in a column that's going to come out later this week, Chris, and, and I'll steal a line from that column. If this team was a Bond movie, it'd be live and die by the three. This team's going to shoot a lot from the perimeter, but maybe he's got something bubbling inside as well in Jesse Edwards. Yeah, Jesse, Jesse, and it's always dangerous to take to make your takeaway a, a center um, from these Division II games, but but he he is the thing that I sort of, you know, felt the most optimistic about and maybe changed my perspective in a, in a positive way. Uh, not that I was negative. Right. But, 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 you know, okay. I can see this Skeptical, going well. Yeah. Um, gr- re- looked really good with his hands, um, like popped out from the middle to, to challenge the shot and block the shot at the free throw line, which, which it's been a while since Syracuse has had a center athletic enough to, to, to get out there and, and really, you know, defend that shot. You know, guys like Pascal were were able to defend maybe the rim, but but he wasn't able to get out and like make right. that shot yeah. difficult. Um, Barama, unfortunately, you know, another knee injury, and we haven't seen him at his most mobile. Um, 
So just just the way Jesse moved, you know, you can see that, that you know, they've got some mobility in the center and, and he can get to places which he's probably going to need to, right? Because they're not the fat, they don't have the most foot speed. Uh, all their guys are smart defenders, you know, Joe, Buddy, Cole, Jimmy. Um, but they're not exactly the, the fleetest of foot. Um, if they get into like scrambling situations. So, so Jesse's going to be counted on to kind of, you know, cover up any, any times guys slip through and, and looked capable of it. Cole was out there hitting threes. I think we expected that the catch and shoot, the ability to just kind of add another dimension to the offense, Chris, it'd be one thing if he was like the primary three point shooter. I mean, he was a 40% three point shooter a year ago on Villanova and he was like the fourth or fifth option. He's going to be a higher option on this team, but maybe not number one. But I can't wait to see the back and forth between him and Buddy Bayheim to see who's going to make more threes on this team. You know, I think Gerard is in that conversation too. But, Chris, you know, Joe was top seven in the ACC in assists last year. You would think by natural attrition, just by running the point a little bit more, having Jesse to go to inside, having a couple other options to dish to when – that outside shot is not there. And he's going to dish off some assist to Buddy wide open on the wing probably right. three, four times a game, right? Yeah, you get some cheapies. He's going to get top two or three in the ACC in assists this year. I, I feel like you're going to see that number spike a little bit. So, again, it's one exhibition game, but it's hard not to look and say, okay, there's there's some stuff here with this team. And last night, uh, for those of you who remember that great uh, 80s movie War Games, it went from DEFCON 5 to like DEFCON 2 for two minutes there. When Buddy Beheim walked in the locker room, they're like, oh, well, what is going on here? But he came right back out, seems to be okay, just kind of, you know, sprained his ankle a little bit, rolled his ankle. I'm sure he'll be fine and, and ready to go. Syracuse doesn't play again until Monday against LeMoyne, the mighty LeMoyne Dolphins coming in again. We remember that exhibition game they won about 10 years ago or so. Uh, so a little bit of a, a scare there, but you mentioned Barama, unfortunately, man. I, I feel awful for this kid, all the injuries he's gone through. John Bullijox, a little. Uh, dinged up right now. So some some early injury things to keep an eye on there for Syracuse. But what other things jumped out to you last night, Chris? Because the other thing I was really keeping an eye on was Jimmy, Jimmy Beheim. And we've seen certainly, you know, when Syracuse has played Cornell, maybe you followed Jimmy a little bit at Cornell, but I see the glue guy. I see the guy kind of brings it all together. He can chew from the outside. I think he can get inside. I think he'll rebound better than people anticipate. I mean, he's been around the two, three zone his whole life. You think by osmosis, he'll be able to kind of adjust to it and play it as well as can be here. I, I feel like he's going to just fit right in and kind of be that glue guy that ties it all together. What, what did you see uh, from Jimmy and, and maybe some other things that we haven't mentioned yet? Yeah. You know, I think, I, I think he showed signs that he can do this, right. But, but he's going to have to be a little He's going to have to take some of the playmaking duties that Marek did last year right. because they don't have a lot of guys when they play a really good, aggressive defensive team like Houston. You know, we've heard Jim say that against teams like that, you have to beat your man and you have to go make a play. And they don't have a lot of guys who are going to beat their man and, and just go make a play. Um, by driving to the basket. So the other option there is to get the ball to somebody in the post-up situation, you know, make the defense react to them and, and you know, let Jimmy or Marek make plays. Um, I don't know that Jimmy's going to be bringing the ball up the floor like Marek. You know what? Well, well, he was sort of that emergency valve. Um, but he looked really comfortable and more aggressive than Marek did in, in terms of like trying to make a post move, trying to be a threat down there, trying to make the defense respect him. And, and it's certainly not something that Syracuse is going to make their bread and butter. Um, but you want to have something in there. And, and it looks like he's, you know, comfortable being aggressive, that, that teams aren't going to be able to completely ignore him. And hopefully that frees up, right? He gets the ball. Defenses have to at least come toward him a little bit, and then he's finding those shooters, you know, the, the inside-out three-pointers, um, because there should be all sorts of space. Chris, I, I'm intrigued by defense, too. I mean, I'm always intrigued by this team defensively and how it comes together, but this non-conference schedule is a bear. Yeah. And yeah. to kind of go through trial by fire, and what that defense is going to have to be is just good enough 
just make some stops because there's such an overflow on the offensive side of the ball. If anything, your offense will be your best defense in some yep. ways. And we mentioned there's some names familiar with it, but it's one thing to know the zone. It's another to play the zone. You've got Cole Swider learning to play the zone. You've got Benny Williams learning to play the zone. And, and there's a name we haven't mentioned yet. Uh, people already dismayed that Benny Williams is not in the starting lineup. Like everybody just take a breath. Benny Williams is going to play. It's going to be okay. It doesn't matter if he starts or not. I think we've learned this lesson from your Jim Beheim lineups over the years that it's not the starting five. It's just who's in the game when it matters. Yep. Let him ease Benny in at his own pace. I think people just get a little hysterical about these things. Saimir learning the zone when he gets in. I think Joe and Buddy are going to play a ton of minutes in that backcourt, but we'll see Saimir at times, right? Jimmy knows it, lives it, breathes it, but has to now play it. So how quickly that adjustment happens will be fascinating to watch. And as we mentioned, there's some good teams in that non-conference schedule, but it just has to be good enough. There are years when Syracuse leans on its defense. I don't feel like this is one of those years. If it comes along, it's a great bonus. And now you've got a balanced team, but there's such an offensive focus. It feels like from this team that I don't want to say that it doesn't matter. It does, but they just kind of have to get by on defense for lack of a better term. Yeah. They can't be bad. Right, like, like they're, like they're going to score points, and, and they have to be okay, probably defensively. You know, just good enough to get by. Um, you know, they can't be Notre Dame. <laughs> you know, like Mike Mike Bray has had some really good offensive teams that have just been atrocious defensively and can't stop right. anybody. You know, they can't be that. Um, and if they were playing man to man, I would worry that they would be that. But they have great length. You know, the zone, you know, emphasizes length, um, you know, and if you can play it together a, as a unit, you can sort of overcome some defense, some individual shortcomings. Uh, so, you know, I'm with you. I, I'm really curious as they play good teams, you know, how that defense looks um, and rebounding too, right? This isn't, you know, Syracuse teams don't block out. It, it's, you know, because Jim doesn't think it's effective in the zone. It, it's be athletic and go get the ball. And they don't have a ton of athleticism, you know, on this team. So, so Benny will probably be asked to do a lot of rebounding as a freshman, which can be difficult as a freshman. Jesse's going to have to be really good there, um, I, I would think. And then Jimmy and Cole are certainly solid physical guys and, and shouldn't be out muscled. Um, but you know, they're going to have to be aggressive and, and quick to the ball. Again, take it in the uh, take it for what it's worth category. But Syracuse only out rebounded pace by, I believe, th I don't have the box score right in front of me, but I think it was 36-33, yeah. something along those lines last night. So just noted for the future here. And, and, and sometimes that happens. You know, we've heard we've heard three-point shots are difficult to rebound, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. from, from, you know, Jim before. So, so it's – but, yeah, like, you know, you don't want that to – you know, it's not good when you're getting out-rebounded by pace or, or, or pace is hanging around with you on the boards. And it may not be November yet, Chris, but Jim Beheim in mid-season form at the press conference last night, defending Dino Babers and just kind of getting some some pent-up thoughts out there. So we're rolling, baby. He missed us. What's that? He missed us, clearly, he right? Yeah. I think he did. I, I, I think he did. That's for sure. So uh, looking forward to that as always. Well, looking forward to having you back down the road here, Chris. Thanks for hanging with us today, though. Thanks to everybody that popped in the comments and, and watched us live. But again, a reminder – uh, perhaps you are watching us on the recorded version of Orange Weekly. We do archive this on YouTube. You can find it on our Syracuse Orange Sports YouTube page. So subscribe there. You can find it on Syracuse Orange Football and Basketball on Facebook. So make sure you like that page. And, of course, follow us on Twitter at SYR Football and our basketball page as well. So you can get uh, Orange Weekly delivered to you even if you can't be here. We are here live Thursdays presented by Krause Health about 1 o'clock or so. And a reminder that I'll be with you for Syracuse football post game after the Orange take on Boston College Saturday at the Dome. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. We will talk to you again soon here on Orange Weekly, presented by Krause Health. Have a great rest of your week.